So guys, we just finished our chem SCT. It's time for the physics SCTs. The physics SCT is very different from the chem SCT. And uh, the chem SCT had only MCQs, but that's not going to be the case for biophysics. Biophysics is going to have true or false, assertion, reason type questions, uh, and it's going to have essay. Essay questions are the big place where you know people are people are worried about that and also there's minimals so basically minimals we will cover the minimals in each video we will try to at least don't don't count on us completely okay i'm being completely honest here don't count on us completely but the minimals we'll try our best to complete the minimals you have to learn you have to learn the minimals you have to like put them in your skull okay because the first five minimal questions, these are easy money. You need to get the minimal questions right. So learn all the minimals. There's about 50, I think. Like as of this first semester, 50 or 60 questions. Most of the questions are one line answers. Learn the minimals. Very important. From today, learn the minimals. Okay. So today's chapter is sedimentation, electrophoresis, and mass spectrometry. Let's start with sedimentation. Before that, I want to give credit to our wonderful professor, Mr. Thibor G. Santo. Amazing slides. Because of, this, because of the fact that he made these amazing slides, we are making these such, we are making these videos, and we are able to explain these concepts to you. So let's start off. Sedimentation technique. Why the hell do you need sedimentation in the first place? In biophysics and cell molecular biology, we need to categorize molecules. We're talking about small macromolecules, the smallest, not the smallest unit of, units of life, that's atoms, that's really different. We're talking about molecules, we're talking about DNA, we're talking about proteins, okay, we're talking about antibodies, all of these, these are, these are molecules. And we're talking at such a small scale to understand the density, the mass, and the size, the shape, all of these characteristics of these molecules, it's very hard to do that because they're so, they're so small, right? So there are a few, few techniques that we can use to understand the mass or uh, the size, yeah? The density of these molecules. How is that we use sedimentation for that? So let's start. We used it to characterize the size and density of macromolecules and separate molecules based on the size. Also separate molecules. When you're studying vast amounts of macromolecules, you want to be able to separate them so you can study them individually. And how do you separate them? You set or separate them using sedimentation. Now, sedimentation is, you can't just take a test tube, put all your stuff, macromolecules in there and expect them to just separate out on, the, on themselves. That doesn't happen, okay? It's not that easy because macromolecules don't just, they don't just sediment. That is, in normal gravitational force, macromolecules don't just sediment. If that was the case, then the human body is 80% water. All the molecules in our body would sediment. You understand? It's in basic gravity, our molecule, macromolecules do not sediment. Why is that? Let me try to explain this. Let's take one macromolecule. Don't know what it is. It could be anything. Let's take one of those. And let's calculate the potential energy due to gravity. Okay? Let me explain this. My pencil. When it's on the ground, flat. Okay, when it's on the ground, flat. It has zero potential energy due to, due to gravity. It's like, let me... Let me do this over here. It's like a, no, let me draw, let me take that, okay. Mm -hmm. It's a man, okay. A man. He is, this is the ground, I suppose, okay. This is the ground. And he's attached to the ground by, oh, no, 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 no by a elastic or a rubber band for example okay he's anchored to the ground he's anchored to the ground with an elastic 
Now, if I were to lift this guy up, if I were to lift this guy up, up to here, okay, now that that rubber band has stretched, means you know, you know that basically he's gonna come down with more force because when you stretch the band, it has more force, more tension energy inside it, right? Same concept applies for gravitation also, but there's no string attached, of course. So when you take a human being or whatever it may be up this high, this has like a reserve. It's like it has a bank. Every object has like this bank, which is empty. But as soon as you lift it up, it the bank, like it's like a battery reserve. When you lift it up, it charges up, okay? Ready to go down again, right? So what happens? How do you find the potential energy inside that object? How do you know, okay, fine, I lifted this object th at this height. When I leave this, just as it is right now, how much potential energy does this have to fall down back on the earth? Okay, how do you calculate that? You take the height and you take the gravitational constant. Okay, that is 9.8. That is G. Okay, 9.8. What is the gravitational constant? It's basically for every one kilo, how much does the earth pull it? Okay, pull it. You understand? For every one kilo, how much does the earth attract that one kilo? Basically, the earth's gravitational force. Okay, that's 9.8 newtons per kgs. You understand? So, we take the height, we times it with the gravity with the gravitational constant and also we times it with your mass mass is important you know of course it is uh, the more mass you have the more potential energy you're gonna have okay the more the more force you're gonna provide when you impact the floor yeah okay so that formula right there e p or yeah that's the potential energy will be m into g into h this is mgh now this is the mass of the whole object okay the whole object we're talking about the mass of this whole thing right here let me just wait of this whole thing right here but when you're talking about macro molecules you're talking about a molecule inside this think about it a molecule inside that so we're going to have to divide this whole mass to find out that one molecule's mass, right? That's what happens here. Molecular mass, something but grams per mole. The mass of a molecule inside an object will be that uh, in, gra in grams is going to be that, okay? It's going to be the total mass divided by the Avogadro's number, okay? What is the Avogadro's number? Avogadro's number is basically like a quantity. It's like, you know how you say dozens? 12 airports will make a dozen of airports. 12 apples will make a dozen of apples. 12 whatever will make a dozen of whatever. And a pair, two of, two iPads make a pair of iPads. Two fans make a two, make a pair of fans. Same way, six into 10 raised to 23 is like a quantity. If there is anything, if there is, like we take 12 airports makes a dozen of airports. Same way, if you take 602 sextillion, 204 quintillion, 76 quadrillion airports, you get a mole of airports. You understand? Mole doesn't just apply to small, small as quantities, but also you can just say that in a way. You understand? But that's literally impossible because nobody's producing 606 sextillion, 214 quintillion, and 76 quadrillion airports. No. But you know what it is possible for? For macromolecules because there are trillions and trillions of macromolecules all around us. So that's why mole, mole applies to them. Okay? When you compare trillions with... Six, oh no, sextillion is way greater than trillions. But you understand that, right? This value could only theoretically work for macromolecules or atoms, 
for example. That's why we use it in chemical uh, in in chemistry and physics. So you divide your mass by that, okay, by the Avogadro's number, and you get your molecular mass. Simple, okay. Oh, uh, this is in grams, twenty three. In kg, you get twenty six because you do ten. Uh, you do this times ten raised to three. Oh, I got the biophysics SCT locations. Very good. Thank you. I'll, I'll later, you do into times ten raised to three. You add this and this, you get this. Now, so what do we? What am I telling you this for? We see that a what that a particle placed inside a tube. Just no speed. You're not centrifuging it. Just, just you just keep it like that. What you notice is when you calculate the potential energy for this being so small, you can just imagine how small the potential energy is going to be. And yes, it is super small. It's one point six into ten raised to minus twenty two joules. Okay. Now, an interesting question would be, since let's take this as a ground level. Anything, any distance lifted up from this should have a positive, uh, should have a positive potential energy, right? Anything, even even at the smallest distance lifted, it should have a positive potential energy, and it should, yes. But the thing is, when you're measuring gravitational potential energy, we are usually measuring based on two surfaces because all objects attract each other. So, an object, I am attracting everyone right now. I'm attracting this airport, I'm attracting everything, but because my force is so small, nothing is being felt. Okay? So, an object placed at an infinite distance from another object. We take an object, has a gravitational force, of course. Of course it does. Every day, everything has a gravitational force. Okay? We take this object, object A, for example, place it infinite distance from object B. The potential energy, gravitational potential energy between them will be zero. Understand? Will be zero. So if we measure, look at this. If we are measuring the potential energy from object A, as we go up, it's going to increase positively. But if we're measuring the potential energy from object B, then coming down here, okay, it's going to be negative for, for object B in the in in the perspective of object B, it's going to be negative. I hope you understand, right? Because it's like the opposite. Okay? Because uh, over here, when you lift it up, it's positive. But from here, when we measure and bring uh, uh, from planet B, we pull it down, it's negative for us. For us, it's negative. But if we flip this whole thing around, if you bring B over here, a over here okay then this going up is going to be positive and from a coming down it'll be negative for the people in planet b understand uh, one more time in planet a you increase an object's height it's going to have positive potential energy but from b well, we are observing from here okay this is us we are observing us observing from object B, when an object is increased in height, for us, it's negative, okay? But if we flip the whole thing around, planet B is here, and they are measuring planet A, an object in planet B raised in height will be positive for them. But for us, but for them looking over here, them observing, an object in planet A increased in height will be negative for them. Understand? So apparently we are measuring according to Another surface, that's why we're getting negative. This wasn't really a, a very important thing that I had to tell you, but I'm just telling you this. Okay. Over here we can see it's positive. 10 raised to minus 22 doesn't make negative. It just it just means that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 22 times. So we're gonna get a super small value. Okay. Wasn't really important. I don't know why I added that much, but yeah. You have to explain, you have to understand these concepts because the exam paper is gonna be concept based completely concept based now we see that the potential energy has a super freaking small value what about it what about the value being small why does it not sediment even if it has that much if it ha even if it has such a small value it should over time sediment no no because the basic thermal energy thermal energy being what 
in a given moment every single thing in this universe the atoms of that part of that object are vibrating they are vibrating like crazy and that vibration releases thermal energy which is super super small but it's still present now it's present okay so it's present now what turns out to be that the value of that thermal energy which exists everywhere is almost similar to the potential energy of a macromolecule so they cancel out so because of that the particle never sediments because the basic thermal energy of the particles everywhere is equal to the potential energy of this so it just cancels out understand that's why we need a force larger than gravitation to produce a uh, sedimentation okay that's one concept that's i just explained you now let's look at the type of sedimentation sedimentations what can be used oh also also this formula included in the minerals i'm going to explain it to you later on but again formulas included in the minerals basics of uh, physics basic physical definitions included learn it i hope i i explain it pretty well okay and this formula also is included in the basic physical definitions this is just this blue box basically explaining that when you spin the object okay it produces a higher gravitational field okay learn the formula might ask in a minimal learn the formula uh, it's uh, in the minerals as you can see right here okay learn this learn all all of that okay even this and this right here e part is equal to mgs right there now sedimentation techniques there are three very important because they might ask this for an essay okay they might just be like explain sedimentation velocity method and they must they might just ask explain all that you understand very important learn this sedimentation this and that three methods are there very important is what property are they determining why are we carrying out that process to find out what value of the macro molecule sedimentation velocity is to find sedimentation constant density gradient is in the name is used to find density sedimentation equilibrium is used to find find molecular weight okay now let's start with sedimentation uh, velocity method what does it measure sedimentation velocity method measures okay the rate at which a macro molecule falls down due to centrifugal force in other words what how much speed does it take for a molecule in a centrifugal force to reach the bottom of the tube okay the faster a molecule does that the lighter it is the slower a molecule does that means go from a position here to the bottom of the tube etc the more heavier it is or the more mass it has okay let's what look what we do we place the tube like this in a centrifugal for in a centrifuge machine and we spin the bit spin it hard okay full force what do we see we see a few things now see i would explain what the swedberg's equation is and i would want to explain the whole thing but since the derivation is not there and the formula is also not too important i'm not going to do that but let me explain the whole thing for again an object is placed here it has centrifugal force of course because you're spinning the it's so hard so it's going to have centrifugal force but then it's placed in a buffer solution in a liquid so obviously because of the liquid there's going to be buoyant force coming up like that so that's fb and like anything in the universe there's going to be friction involved that's ff we have all these values here do you need to know the you do you need to know the formulas for this basic formulas yes would not hurt for you to know would not would not be a bad thing if you write these formulas in your essay questions understand so learn the particle the particle doesn't accelerate the sediments at a constant speed okay what happens is basically we are looking for how fast does this does this particle stop at this constant speed at a constant speed what happens is it just slowly the spinning the spinning is at a constant speed so the particle slowly comes down and rests over here 
at one point it's going to do that okay so what we're measuring is the rate at which it comes down okay maybe one molecule a fatter molecule comes down here slower but a smaller molecule may come down here really fast so that's what you're measuring okay so what do we want we want equilibrium we want that this at, at one point this force and these forces add up to zero okay so that's what we do here we can we assume that fc is equal to fb plus ff all of these formulas are there but do we need to learn the derivation no so i'm just going to run through this so basically what we get is we get something called the sedimentation coefficient or the swedberg's constant okay important it's in the minimals learn it this value super important one square swedberg is equal to 10 raised to minus 3 seconds basically super small amount of time swedberg equation is basically a super small amount of time so the more i mean there probably is like you know like how you say 10 raised to minus 9 is nanoseconds there probably is something for 13 as well but this guy just thought you know what let me put my name on it said works equation so basically the more values of s an object has like a macromolecule like 3s uh, 10s okay the more faster it from in a tube the object comes boom down understand in a constant speed of course okay so it's uh, so it's not that an object is like they slowly keep increasing the velocity increasing 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 no they stop at a constant velocity at one velocity they stop and it's just spinning 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 so basically what does s measure the rate at which the particle sediment to the ground okay or learn it in this fashion which is more uh, likely of you getting marks uh, for the question this formula might be asked might be asked okay is it in the minimals no that's why i'm telling it may not be asked but may also be asked and it won't be a bad thing to include in your essay let's learn all the values velocity angular momentum radius angular velocity momentum uh, radius mass uh, friction density 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 of the buffer density of the object learn that and then this later on this is important but we're going to have to combine this with another method okay so that's that over here so what do we find out by doing this of course we find out the sort of Swedberg's constant but we also find out that the molecules like if you do a certain number of molecules if you do two three molecules and we find out the uh, Swedberg's equation uh, the constant for them then using the Swedberg's constant we can figure out okay fine two molecules one is a chunky boy and one is a small boy. This comes down slower, this comes down faster. But why? Using the Swedberg's constant, which this formula over here we can see, Swedberg's constant is very determined on the mass of the object and the friction. Okay? Now the mass varies well, self explanatory Mass increases, S increases. Okay? And then F increases, oh sure, what happened? Oh, my pasta is ready. Okay. I'm hoping it shuts up. Okay. 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 Shut up. Okay. And friction is dependent on the size. If it has a larger size, it's going to have more friction. Smaller size, less friction. Understand? So using the S, we can determine, we can separate quantity, uh, the particles based on their molecular weight and size. Okay. Then we have sedimentation equilibrium method. Very simple. Let's do this quickly. Sedimentation equilibrium method is basically the same as sedimentation velocity method. But the spinning is much slower. Much slower. And the time that it's done for is much longer. Sedimentation velocity method is just you put the macromolecule in there. Done. You get, you get your values. You get your S. You get whatever you want. Sedimentation equilibrium method is at a slower speed. The it's like mm, for a long time, I, and I'm telling days or weeks. Okay, why is that? After all the particles have sedimented, you know, at one point they all will. What happens is if you keep on keep 
the, cent the centrifuge going on, a reverse process happens called diffusion. After sedimentation has finished, a reverse process takes place called diffusion. That's crazy for that to be spinning and the pores coming like this, but then diffusion takes place. But that's, that's after a long time. Okay, so we wait for diffusion to happen. And, and what we see is, what we see is, a lighter molecule, if we are measuring two molecules, okay, and one is fat and one is small. After sedimentation, they both will sediment at one point of time. But in diffusion, the smaller particle with the less mass, okay, is going to go higher up than the fatter molecule. So at the end of the diffusion process as well, our, our lighter molecule is going to be up here, but our fatter molecules are going to come right here, just here. So looking at this, the scientists can measure, okay, fine, this molecule has more weight, has more weight than this. This molecule has more that and that. Then we can use all of that, okay? We can use the values that we get from this uh, experimentation and calculate the molecular weight using this formula, okay? Now, do not know what this means. Not included in the minimals, but know the formula, know what D, K, T, F is, and know this, know everything basically in this formula so that if they ask you you're not like surprised oh i've never seen this formula before because you have don't lie to yourself learn all these values okay so using that you can just calculate the molecular mass so using the molecular which method can you calculate the molecular weight the answer is sedimentation equilibrium method not velocity okay now this slow this graph they might give you they might give this graph and ask an uh, true or false something like that so what is given by the slope of this graph okay you have to understand normalized concentration by radius okay this slope gives us the molecular weight this is the slope that gives us the molecular weight the molecular weight can be determined by the slope of the graph important learn that then we have uh, let's figure the certification okay basically what happens let me take my test tube right here and i'll keep it there Okay, no, no, let me draw this whole thing in a whole different page. Let me take my test tube here. Okay, I'm gonna take, that's my test tube. That's my beautiful test tube. Okay, now I'm gonna take a few beakers here. Okay, and they're gonna contain liquids of, uh, let's say, let's say, we take some, some buffer, okay, some buffer, we take some kind of a buffer, like, like for example, cesium chloride, okay. In this beaker, in beaker A, B, C, D, I add a 50% solution of CSCl. Means there's going to be 50% water and 50% CSCl. Over here, I add 40% CSCl. Over here, I add 30% CSCl. Over here, I add 20% CSCl. And I keep on going like this. Till, you know, 1%, 2%. Maybe I, I do 55. Uh, maybe I do 50. Maybe I do 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, 35, 20, 25. Understand? Density thing. So now what I'm going to do is first off, add the 50%, the most dense. Spin the spin it in a centrifuge and then all the 50% is deposited here. Okay? Then I add my 40%. Then my 40% is deposited here. Okay? Then I add my 30%. 30% is deposited here. Then I add my 20% and my 20% is divided here. Okay. So as you can see over here, there's a density gradient formed. This is the most dense. This is the least dense. 
And since we know the density of CHCl, CSCl, we can determine, you know, if a molecule stops. Okay, no, no, let me, I'm going too far. So what happens in this method? Same thing happens. We use a centrifuge. We use, uh, we put the macromolecule in a test tube, but we create, as you can see over here, a density gradient in the buffer of the test tube. So when we spin it, the molecule is going to stop at a point. At what point? It's going to stop at the point where the density of the CSCL is equal to the density of this molecule. Okay. So it's going to stop maybe here, maybe here, somewhere. But what we know that when it, when it stops here, the density of this molecule is going to be equal to the density of the CSCL at that point. And we know the density, we know the density of CSCL. So we can find out the density of the molecule. Boom. That's what density centrifuge, gradient mm -hmm. centrifugation is used for. Okay. Use CSCL as an example in your essay questions, if they ask an essay question. So that's how density gradient works. You determine the density of a molecule or particle to separate particles based on their density. Okay. Centrifugation is done. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, in a medium whose density is equal to its own density, it's going to stop. Okay. This formula highlighted, maybe, uh, maybe we already know the values. That's mass, angular velocity, radius, density, density. So not going to be asked, but learn. Okay. So this is how I explain that. And where is this used? We can see over here. It's used to separate the blood particles. Okay. There's going to be blood separation fluid over here. And the C, the densities of all the particles in our blood are different. So the density of the red blood cells is more than density of the separation fluid. It's more than density of monocytes like leukocytes, erythrocytes, monocytes, all of that. And density, more than density of the semen, uh, serum, serum, more than density of the serum, uh, serum, serum. More than density of serum, okay? So they're all gonna separate out like that. And then we can be like, okay, fine, this has more density. No, this has less density. This has more density. This has more density. This has more density. Because we know that the density increases like that. Simple enough to understand. I hope this is easy. Now we move on to electrophoresis. And uh, right now uh, I wanna eat my pasta. So I am not gonna be doing that. I'll be doing this, don't worry. But not now. I'll go eat my pasta right now. So bye bye. Okay, let's continue with electrophoresis. Electrophoresis is the migration of charged particle electrical species when dissolved or suspended in an electrolyte through which electric current is passed. Very simple, I think you all have learned this in high school as well. We take a solution which could contain a matrix or not contain a matrix, and I'll explain what matrix is. Or it could be a solution, it could be a gel, it could be whatever that can carry a charge or electric field in through it. Connect it to a battery, positive end, negative end. Place your stuff in like wells. This is for gel electrophoresis, but like let's con con place them somewhere here and then they will separate out form lines like that based on their charges and sizes. Boom, got it, finished. Over here, we have a particle which has a negative charge. So it is gonna scurry towards the positive side. And we can see that this is because of the force applied on this object using due to the electric field. And over here, we will obviously experience friction. We always experience friction. In uh, So basically, what an important point in this whole uh, slide is, which is also included in the min minimals, electrophoretic mobility. The electrophoretic mobility is the electrophoretic velocity in unit electric, electric field. Basically, when you place a charged particle in an electrophoretic medium and you apply one coulomb of electric field in that electrophoretic medium, okay? With that, because of that one coulomb, how fast does this particle move towards its the, the opposite uh, uh, electrode, okay? So that's basically the electrophoretic mobility. Over here, we have the formula for that pretty simple. U is equal to V by E. V is velocity. E is electric field, of course, EF. Now, what it also depends on, okay, U, U that is electrophoretic, the charge of the particle by the frictional coefficient. Frictional coefficient. 
Now you guys might think, oh, it says form factor here. Well, what do you think form factor means? Okay, that can't be measured. You can't just look at a circular thing and be like, oh, the F for you is that. No, basically frictional coefficient. So it's saying that if I were to take a huge object and a small object, this would have a higher F and this would have a lower F. Why? Because obviously since it has larger like surface area, it will experience more friction than this. This can, you know, this won't feel at that much friction. You get what I'm saying, right? So yeah. That is that. So it ripples on Q and F. And over here it says ZEF. Now y'all will be confused, but Z is basically atomic number. Atomic number. So with the atomic number, you get to know how many electrons are there. And once you know the number of electrons, you just multiply Z into E minus, that's a charge. If you guys know, I think it's 1.6 Newton raised to minus 90, I think. You add that, uh, multiply that too, so you get the charge. And then F remains the same, it's okay. So, electrophoresis, okay, it basically uh, separates out the particles, the macromolecules, on the basis of size and charge. Moving on. Very, I think this is important, important, because they might, this is a very easy question to kind of ask for the essay type questions. Free angel electrophoresis. Very simple. The main concept is the medium. The medium is the main uh, difference. For free electrophoresis, you use a solution. Uh, a solution which does not contain a matrix. Matrix free. And I think now I should explain to you what matrix is. Matrix is basically a kind of like a weave-like structure within the electrophoretic medium like that. Something like that. Basically like a sieve, like this. Okay, I was eating grapes. So this is a sieve and, oh shit, what fell on my iPad? Okay, so yeah, it's a sieve basically, okay? So it basically creates this kind of friction so that the particles which are smaller in size can pass through and the bigger in size they can like pass through but they have to work for it and when will they work for it when they have extra when they have that charge you know so it, adding that little bit of friction increases lowers the sensitivity why do we want lower sensitivity we need a matrix because if there was no if it was high sensitivity sensitivity like it is in free electrophoresis what tends to happen is there is no clear there's no clear difference with the size and the charge when you use free electrophoresis because all the particles will just move towards the positive electrode. Because there's no friction involved, it's so all of them, even if it's the smallest, even if it's the biggest, they all move towards the positive side. Because they can. And they have. it's not like they don't have charges. They both are negatively charged. But when you add a matrix, it separates out or lets this guy pass through and settles here, but this doesn't pass through and so it settles here. So that you get those discrete lines, so which you can be like, okay, fine, this is, has this has less, uh, more charge and less mass, this has more, you get, you get what I'm saying? So, that's basically it. So it says over here, first thing, matrix free, electrophoresis in which charged particles move through. <laughs> Wait, oh, my eyes are hurting, so I'm trying to see if it has one of those uh, night shift thing. Yeah, it's gonna be a bit yellow now. Okay, that's nice. So, uh, yeah, that's there. Matrix free, moves in solution. Electrophoresis takes place in a gel. High sensitivity, like I said. Uh, gel el eliminates, slows down diffusion. Okay, uh, basically, now, diffusion. The diffusion is a big thing. We saw diffusion in the equilibrium method also, but I want to explain it a bit more. Diffusion is the natural property of an object to move from uh, higher concentration to areas of lower concentration. Okay. It's a very, it's a very cool concept and a very, uh, 
it's probably explainable but for me it's like wow how come okay so like let's say you take a, we take a container like this we put atmospheric air inside it so there's n2s o2s co2s o2 n2 n2 co2 o2 o2 n2 o2 co2 co2 <laughs> Uh, whatever 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 and now in this container you were supposed to, you open it up and fill up a bunch of n2s here what happens is the natural property of these n2 particles is to move away from higher concentration and move towards lower concentration so i don't know how to explain this but the n2 particles this is why i said it's not i don't know how to explain but the N2 particles somehow know where these N2 particles are and they move away from it to a lower concentration area of N2. And these CO2 molecules placed close together, they will eventually separate out, creating uh, like going towards areas of low uh, concentration. And so if we leave this container for a long, long time, when we come out, we're going to see that all the gases are evenly spread out Okay, so basically there is like, there is, they're all separated out and there is no one region where, okay, fine, this region has a high concentration of CO2 or this region has a high concentration of N2. No, they're all spread out. This happens in solutions. This happens in gases. This happens everywhere. This is like a natural, it's like entropy. It's basically entropy, increases the randomness. Okay. We learned in uh, chemistry, the thermodynamics, that the second law is that the entropy of the universe will increase. Basically, the randomness of the universe will increase. And everything at the end will lead to chaos. Why is that? Because I'm, I'm totally going off track now, but let's listen for some time. It's cool. Because uh, there is more ways to be wrong than there is ways to be right. Now, you would like all the H2 molecules to be lined up like that. That's what you would consider, you know, that's the right way. But the nature, but nature says, okay, no, yes, you are right. This may be one of the right ways, but we could be spread out and messed up in a billion other ways. So that's why I'm going to tend to do that rather than doing your thing that you want me to do. Okay. So the, that's what I'm saying. That's why entropy in this universe always increases the there is a lot more ways to be disorganized to be or than to be organized that's why entropy always increases but let's go back to this and diffusion so diffusion is basically moving from high concentration to low concentration and that's what happens over here as well once all the particles sediment over here Diffusion takes place because it's like, oh, wait, this is too much of a high concentration. So let's move away from it towards lower concentrations. Understand? So in that process, the lighter molecules usually go up and the smaller molecules usually come, the heavier molecules are usually down. But that's the main concept of diffusion. Okay? So that happens everywhere. So you do not want that in gel electrophoresis. That's what you don't want. Because if there's a lot of diffusion everywhere then you can't like get those discrete lines to to differentiate between you know okay fine because what are these discrete lines these are basically concentrated parts high concentrated parts but if there is diffusion you know you it will be something like that and it's not going to be a thick straight line you don't want that in a solution the diffusion is not negligible what does this mean basically diffusion is noticeable so you don't get those discrete lines like you get in electrophores and you want lines. That's so awkward. bro. So you want those lines and uh, you don't want diffusion. But in free electrophoresis, diffusion is pretty noticeable. So it complicates the separation of molecules. It's expensive and only small amount of sample can be isolated. Therefore, it's rarely used nowadays. We don't use it anymore, basically. Then on the other hand, we have advantages. Small amount of samples are needed. And very small samples can be fully separated with high reproducibility. That means you can do it again and again and again. Separated fractions can be even labeled. 
and because of the fact that a gel contains this matrix the process of diffusion is harder okay so now since the process of diffusion is harder there is more possibility of being right orderly than to be messed up so this is a very very weird way that the nature works so diffusion is almost negligible in gels so that's good we want that widely used gel electrophores are widely used for separation of nucleic acids and proteins uh, nucleic acids is done as gel electrophoresis basically agarose gel and polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis we will learn later on now okay over here we can see it is according to the molecular weight separation okay okay let's move on now gel electrophoresis this is just to get a phi but we want phis so this is nothing just you can go over this slide yourself basically explaining what this is made out what agarose is made out of how it is loaded into the spin negatively charged nucleic acids migrate towards a positively charge we already know that that's so obvious uh yes so we're gonna see this so this is the matrix i was talking about you see this matrix there is electric field passing through like this and the particles which are placed okay like the bigger particle here and a smaller particle here this is gonna have an easy time navigating through this but this guy is gonna have a hard time navigating through this so he's gonna let be left behind and form a big thick line like this but this guy up front is gonna go up front and form a small thick line like that and we can differentiate them now on the basis of their masses okay mm -hmm. so this is basically saying uh on the on the basis of dna dna strands which are like so super long they'll have a hard time like this you can see to pass through the matrix but smaller strands can pass through the matrix and we can differentiate them like that okay uh that's that the electrophores okay over here you can see let's just explain this this is a just a traditional method to uh separate out dna now the main things that we are separating out right now is this line and this line this line is a special line it's a line called the calibration uh, sample or the marker or it's called a dna ladder so basically dna ladders are are like they're bought from different they're bought from companies and companies sell a, a dna ladder or a marker so basically this is a set of dna strands whose lengths and weights and masses are determined okay they know the masses already so when they pass when they do electrophoresis with this the separated samples we know the mass of okay this we know the mass of so when we know the mass of these things being the dna ladder this acts as a reference point for these two guys who we don't know the mass of who we don't know anything about but we know everything about this so when we get this we compare our results with this to this to find out whatever we need to find out so you can see over here wherever they are marked there's 23 there's 29 wherever they stop it they mark it and then based on these measurements they measure this and this okay so that's that you should look over this this is a simple slide but who knows they may ask you how dna separation go uh done or uh, how like gel electrophoresis works so you need to learn this polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis uh while nuclear acids have a okay so polyacrylamide gel elect electrophoresis is basically page polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis okay now what happens is due to the charge aspect of gel electrophoresis that is agarose gel most of the particles are separated on the basis of their charges as well okay but what if you want to eliminate that okay like okay fine let's consider that this part because in gel electrophoresis there's another factor of oh this particle might have a higher charge than this bigger particle so that may be the only reason it went up you know so what if we eliminate that charge side and give everything a single charge and then you can differentiate them based on purely their molecular mass okay so 
uniform charge the, the charge of proteins depends on the amino acid component therefore electrophoretic separation native proteins only not only depends on their size depends on the charge as well so what do we do we take a substance called polyacrylamide poly acrylamide gel electrophoresis which is basically a gel which also has a matrix which we need but before we pass them through the SDS page, what we do is we denature the proteins by adding something called SDS, sodium dodecyl sulfate. So what sodium dodecyl sulfate does is it denatures all the proteins in the DNAs that you're trying to separate out based on molecular weight. And it makes all of the charges in the DNA is negative. All of them are negative now. So now we have like this common playing field where we can separate them only on the basis of molecular weight. Okay, uh, boom. So it denatures the protein, removes the secondary and tertiary structure. All kinds of proteins will have a similar shape. On average, SDS molecules bind to proteins will be uniformly negatively charged. So this see, this is a protein which is not denatured, but on denaturing, they get the shape. They stand like we must have learned the secondary, primary, tertiary structures of a protein. So they uh, finally they come to their uh, primary state and all of them have a evenly spread out negative charge. Prime, we are ready to separate them on the basis of their uh, molecular weight. So it's like they have, it's like, it's like a toothpaste. I don't know how else to say it, it's like toothpaste, but I didn't even brush. So, it's not like I don't brush, I don't brush now, okay? Okay, this technique is called SDS, polycrimalide gel electrophoresis, SDS page. Important. Also, guys, see, this, again, as you can see, this is a very easy topic to make an essay question on. So, I'm pretty sure you guys are smart enough to understand that, okay, fine, this topic looks like an essay question can be made out of it. So, look at those type of topics and be like, okay, fine, I'm going to study this a bit more. And this is one of those topics. They could just be like polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Explain. Okay, so you should understand. Now over here you can see the mobility of the SDS denatured is approximately inversely proportional to the logarithmic of their molecular weight. Basically, it's saying that you can separate them out on the basis of their molecular weight. But this is a very important point to learn because uh, while you're writing your essay, in, in including this can give you that file that you need. Okay. Markers are used for determining molecular weight. Markers, as I said, are stuff that we know the we know definitively the the everything about. We know the molecular weight of that, so we can compare the stuff that we are actually measuring to our markers, who we know everything about. Comparing this to this, we'll get out the values of whatever we want. Let I want to explain how it works. Okay, so I have this whole thing here. Okay. So this is how it works. You add, shit. you add, uh, you have a buffer tank up here. You have a buffer tank on the bottom. And this is your gel. Now your gel is a very different gel compared to agro gel. Agro gel is all just, you know, all just a gel. And it has all the same concentration or something like that. But that's not the same, th that's not the case here for, uh, one second, for uh, our SDS page. So what we do is we have our proteins that have now proteins which are in their primary structure all have a negative charge all in their primary structure. The negative uh, electrode up top, the positive electrode at the bottom so that they move downwards. Now we add them here. Okay. Now there are a few things contained in the buffer. There are solutions in here. Okay. So we need to remember those. What are those solutions? We have, okay, first let's understand, let's understand uh, the gels over here. So the gel is divided into two parts. It has this part on top and this part on the bottom, which has a pH, which is this is basically uh, glycine. Glycine is a component of page, polyacrylamide gel, polyacrylamide. A part of that is glycine, okay? And glycine, this part, this part over here will be at a pH of 6.8. 6.8 being uh, decently acidic, not too acidic, okay? Actually, no, it's basic. 
it's below below seven right it's, it's basic actually yeah it's basic okay so am i am i being right right now let me check i'm i'm, I'm so confused because my brain's fried from the ph values Bro, what? Uh, oh, see, I was being wrong. I was being wrong. So this is acidic. Oh, okay. So yeah, it's it's it is acidic. It is acidic. Lower value. I'm so sorry, guys. I'm so sorry. After chem SCT, this is crazy. After chem SCT. So yeah, fairly acidic, but this definitely uh, a bit more basic, uh, giving it that negative charge, right? What is uh, pH basically? pH is the uh, negative log of H3O+. So when you have more pH, that means you have less amounts of H3O+. H3O+, is positive charge. So when you have less of that, your basically overall charge will be negative. Now I'll explain why I'm explaining you this now. Okay. So we add our, our proteins. This is a protein that we need to separate out. What happens is there is Cl minus present in the buffer, which runs to the first and stands over here. It stands away like that. It's like, I'm ready. Because it's, uh, it's so small, the particles, it's an uh, ion, basically. It runs past and stands, stops right there. Because the pH of this and this is totally different. So, like, this acts like a small boundary, which is not like it can't be overcome. It can, but okay. Now, the proteins come and sit on top of this. Okay. And then from, from up here, what happens is, there is, wait one second, as you can see. Okay. Uh, apologies, not Cl minus, glycine, glycine comes and sit here, glycine molecules present in the ag ag polyacrylamide, they sit over here, and the, pr the proteins which we need to separate come up here, then from behind pushing comes Cl minus, boom, 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 it's pushing, and what it does when it pushes them is arranges the proteins in like this perfect way, stacked way like that, so that they are now freely, like they can freely move and separate out. If they were placed like that, this isn't really giving this guy any space to move. It doesn't, it has to move like that. So this basically acts like a sandwich, which helps to flatten out and distribute all the proteins so that they're easily able to move, okay? Oof. And what was the reason uh, of uh, glycine, the gel over here, being of a higher pH? The glycine molecules, what happens is, the anions, they come into this and they're like, okay, fine. Now I have a higher pH. That means lower amounts of H3O+. That means now I can move freely and this gets a higher overall net negative charge so they all move down quickly cl minus moves down quickly leaving this all separate out here leaving all the proteins to enjoy their sweet time to take you know come around say they can come at how, how much of a pace they want and uh, there's not going to be any cl disturbing them there's not going to be any glycine negative disturbing them so that's why this ph uh, the stacking gel acts as a stacker Okay, and then this resolving gel resolves them into absolutely clear uh, resolution to un understand the differences between their molecular weights. And as you can see over here, we get excellent resolution. Resolution. Boom. Okay. Uh, isoelectric focusing. Isoelectric focusing is basically like density gradient. Remember that you basically create this density, uh, this gradient in density 
so that when a particle macromolecule stops at a point you know the density at that point of the solution so using that you determine the density of this macromolecule also in the same way okay what happens is uh, contain more okay, see let's let's read this first protein is amphetheric they both contain acidic and basic functional groups their charge is ph dependent so they are okay whatever uh i mean i'm saying whatever but for the essay you might need to know this okay you have to know this so just learn the specific ph at which the number of positives and negative charges are equal obviously there's going to be a ph for every for every different type of molecule it's going to be a different type of ph ph is again i'm telling you the concentration of h3o molecules h3o plus molecules and poh is a as the point a concentration of oh mol that's not the correct formula but that basically is the idea so there will be a ph at which the h3o plus content and the oh minus content is going to be the same in the molecule which makes it kind of neutral so what if we were to create just like the density gradient a gradient in ph okay so that when a, a particle stops at a certain point we know the ph of that point so using the ph of that point we find out the ph of this material and the point the specific ph at which the number of positive and negative charges is equal at this point is called isoelectric point important 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 i would say it's very important here yeah. It's a core concept. The protein is neutral. Aim of the technique is to find the isoelectric point of the protein. Guys, remember, whenever you're learning an experiment like SDSP, gel electrophoresis, density gradient method, velocity method, equilibrium method, you should know what they are for. If you don't know what they are for, then what's the use? Boom. Isoelectric focusing, you can just see it in, in action right now. This is a gradient of, oh, no, wait. Bro. Okay, you can see this in action over here. So yeah, go over this pretty easy. I think you understand the basic concept of it. Then we have two dimensional electrophoresis. Okay, this is for a five, but we're still gonna explain it. Electrophoretic separation based on size and charge. Basically gel electrophoresis that like we learned. Isoelectric focusing is the first dimension is followed by SDSPH. Oh, look at that. So what, what do we do first? We find, the isoelectric focusing point why so that the isoelectric focusing fo point we find are very very important before we do sds page we need to find the isoelectric point you know why let me explain imagine this guy's this guy's ph over here is 8.8 but we can increase we can increase or reduce that by the concentration of the gel that we take now imagine this protein's isoelectric point was 8.8 and it just stopped here because it was neutral okay and it didn't move understand so you don't want that to happen so that's why before doing sds page you do uh this thing that is isoelectric focusing to find out what pro type of protein you're working with what's the isoelectric point of the protein etc etc you do SDS page and second one that is proteins are separated on the basis of the isoelectric point in one direction and based on the molecular mass in the other direction so basically now after doing uh, isoelectric focusing and SDS page, you have differentiated them on their pH or their isoelectric point and you have to separate them on their molecular weight. Okay. As you can see, this is that in action. Beautifully, we can see this. Amazing. Okay. So at first we do uh, the isoelectric focusing, then we do the SDS page. Uh, blotting techniques blotting techniques are basically what we do Let's see after we get the results after we get the results of our beautiful gel electrophoresis whatever electrophoresis where we have this clean discrete lines how do we transfer this onto a place where we can like okay look at this and be like okay fine now I see the readings so there are several ways okay you with you can see over here uh, there's something called a nitrocellulose filter. A filter basically which will allow the DNA particles which have been separated right now to pass through it. Okay. 
and then we'll have something called a blotting paper which will it's basically like you know copying so you just put a nitrocellulose filter on top then you put your blotting paper you just press that shit okay and then after you press that shit what happens is your stuff is not transferred to your dna is not tra transferred to the blotting paper no the blotting paper just did there to like add weight and press that shit down but then the real DNA strands are now all transferred onto the nitrocellulose cellulose paper. Now, what we do is hybridize with radioactive nucleic acid probe. Uh, okay. So you basically hybridize with radioactive nucleic acid probe. What, what, what this is, is basically... Uh, radioactive uh, radioactive nucleic acids so they basically waffling it's straight up waffling i don't know let me let me just come back i'm gonna learn this and explain to you okay i'm gonna explain it to you just give me a second so i did not do what i was talking about before i'm really sorry usually uh i thought this would be easy I'm, I'm sorry okay so let me actually explain what this is the previous five minutes i was completely waffling i don't know what i was saying so basically you take your sample your gel on which you have conducted the experiment okay you add your nitrocellulose paper which will have a positive charge okay which will inherently have a positive charge. That paper, nitrocellulose paper, will have a positive charge. You take those two, you add, so you took your, where you've done the DNA. So these are, these are basically DNA strands or protein strands. You add your nitrocellulose paper on top with a positive charge. You add a blotting paper on this, okay? And then you lock it up with like another something over here. You just add, lock this up, Clamp it close, yeah. Clamp it up like this. In this fashion only, you put it inside another vessel. You put this whole thing inside. So you put the whole thing inside. So this is your negative with the gel. This is your nitrocellulose paper with the positive charge. This is your blotting paper. This is your clamps. Okay. And you shut that thing up and you do electrophoresis on this guy. The whole container you do electrophoresis again. Are you? <laughs> yeah, let me draw this out. Okay. So you have your, you have your, your paper. Okay. Let me, let me, let me draw it like this. Okay. Your electrophoretic medium. You add your nitrous paper. Your nitrous paper, you add it right there on top of it. Boom. Then you add your blotting paper. Let's take the blotting paper as pink. You add your blotting paper also. Then you add two like foam pads that like I has said, like I just saw. Foam pads. Okay. Okay, and you clamp this guy shut. Clamp it. Sh oh no, wait, wait. Don't do that. Clamp it shut. Don't do this. So let's label this again. Let's label this again. Uh, electrophoretic medium. And then this is the uh, nitrocellulose paper. paper with inherent positive charge this is negative because we denatured it because we did sds page then we have our blotting paper which is basically nothing it doesn't do that a lot but it's, you need to put that in there then you put this whole damn thing in a container take a container and you and then what you do is just get rid of this so you take this whole damn thing and you put it in 
this. Let me resize this, actually. Oh, shit. Let me... Let me just take this here. Shit, this guy's gone. I need to... Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> okay, let me resize this first. I'm going to resize it, make it smaller. And then I'm going to take it all the way here. So you put the whole damn thing inside a container like this. You close this container. Okay, you are to close this container. Close the container. You close the container. And then you do, this is a bit too up, okay. And you attach this to two electrodes, electrodes. Connect it to a huge ass battery. And you do electrophoresis on this guy. This is the negative terminal, positive terminal. This is filled with a solution, obviously. This is filled with a uh, solution, some sort of a buffer solution, it's filled with. So now look at what happens, look at what happens. Let's zoom into here and let's see what happens during the electrophoresis. The DNA strands which were here, okay, separated out like that. They move towards the positive side, which is, which is this side. So what this DNA fragments do is they move through and they transfer themselves basically onto the nitrocellulose paper. Because of the fact that there is this electric field pulling them that side, from one sh from the gel they go into the nitrocellulose paper. And also the fact that nitrocellulose paper has a positive charge that helps. So that happens, then you remove it and finally you have like this printed type nitrocellulose sheet. And then what you do is you make, you pass radiation through these, they're basically DNA and make this DNA radioactive. And when you make them radioactive, you pass it through certain radiations like UV, something like that. What happens is this, these DNAs, they start to glow in a bright blue or a bright orange. Depends on, okay, sorry, sorry, sorry guys. So yeah, that happens. And then what we get, we get shiny, shiny DNA strands, which are like, okay, fine, beautiful. We can differentiate now. And then we also get this, we can make this digitally by calling it an auto radiogram. And we get that. Okay. Beautiful. You guys should go on YouTube and watch a video on the Western blot. Northern blot, not that important, but Western blot. Watch a video on that, please. Very nice. So yeah, that you understood. Now we're going to talk about mass spectrometry. So it's four more slides. Let me just learn this, these slides and come back again. So I'll be back. Okay. So let's start with mass spectrometry. So mass spectrometry, what is the aim? Like all the other experiments I've done today, let's, let's recap quick. Sedimentation velocity, velocity method. You can find the sweat, sweat box constant. You can differentiate them on the basis of their molecular weight and their size. Uh, then we have sedimentation equilibrium method you can separate them on their molecular weight okay and then we have a uh, density gradient we can separate the molecules based on their uh, density then we have a gel electrophoresis differentiate them uh, differentiate dna in, in particular in uh, for uh, uh, on the basis of charge and size sds page and isoelectric focusing which are usually going hand to hand focuses on differentiating it based on differentiating it i mean proteins based on the uh, uh, molecular weight uh, molecular weight not charge okay so yes let's start with mass spectrometry this is like the same like all these other experiments also is used to determine the constituents of a macromolecule or or differentiate the macromolecules based on their mass and their charge okay over here in mass spectrometry, we differentiate them based on a, on a ratio that is the mass by charge ratio. That's how you usually separate out the uh, material. So for this, you can say mass spectrometry is used to separate out the macromolecules based on their 
charge to mass ratio okay now what is the advantages of this it's high sensitivity and uh, accuracy high sensitivity we understand accuracy obviously it's, uh, accuracy is good for everything it's used a lot in clinical diagnostics so that's why it applies to us that's why we need to learn uh, combined with other separation techniques analysis of complex mixtures com our body is com uh, comprises of complex mixtures understanding them studying them using this uh, technique is easier for us and we can analyze complex and complex and complex stuff okay procedure very simple i'll tell you now you take your uh, whatever your protein usually they are proteins dnas okay usually they are proteins you vaporize them vaporize them into gas form in the gas form ionize them make give them a charge plus or minus okay ionize them in their gaseous form and then you uh, accelerate those ions in an electric field okay and then you analyze those ions while they're being accelerated you analyze them in a different way somehow uh there is a way over here it says analyze the accelerated electron somehow separate them according to their mass by charge ratio okay we can explain that uh, we will explain that and then detect the detect the ions detect the ions which won't be discussed so we don't have to worry about that because that's a good thing that's really really hard actually so let's look at some of the things that we have over here first we have the sample introduction of course this is the sample that we need we introduce sample into the source where they have gas ions gas phase ions so over here the the particle is vaporized and then it's ionized so it's made it's given a charge okay multiple ways to give a charge i'll give it i'll explain now analyzer basically the uh, the ions are, are accelerated completely okay and this ion detector which we won't be doing don't 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 and you can see very important point over here vacuum pumps huge thing huge vacuum the whole thing okay all of these things should be conducted under under a vacuum and i will be explaining why let's move on over here what do you see transfers of molecular to the uh, molecules to the gas phase and ionization okay so this we have to understand mass spectrometry i feel like it has a high chances of coming as a essay question you know what take it from here right now this is going to come as a essay question done deal okay so that's my prediction and i'm going to be doing this for later on i'll give five, i'll give three predictions and let's see if it comes or not okay uh so yeah mass spectrometry the first step of course uh vaporization and ionization vaporization goes without saying it just vaporize them by somehow heating them up to high extreme high temperatures somehow vaporize them make them into gas form and then ionize them esi there are two main techniques over here esi electron spin ionization and maldi let's talk about esi first i'm going to just take a paper here we discussed in slides like uh isoelectric focusing right let's go here okay so over here you can see when you take certain proteins or any type of uh molecules you take them the ph of the solution that they are in influences their charge okay and the the point the ph at which they have no charge where they're neutral is called their isoelectric point and we learned this so what if we can adjust the solution that we put these molecules or these proteins in so that we can charge these uh proteins or molecules that we put inside the solution that's exactly what we do for our uh where it go electron spray ionization basically we charge uh, the solution in the capillary what we do we add our particles that we need to add and this has certain ph which will make these macromolecules positive or negative okay depends on it can be anything but it depends uh, over here we can it seems to be that they are negatively charged okay uh, wait a second i'm sorry no now they positively charged these things are looking to be positively charged so what happens now we understand that these are positively charged now because of the solution that they are placed in they are positively charged now this tip that you see here it's more like an opening let me let me let me do this let me do this let me uh let me kind of like reshape this okay boom uh is kind of like that okay 
I highly recommend that you guys go ahead and watch uh, videos on this. So this is going to be the case. No, no, I don't want that. I do not want that. So what happens, you guys should go ahead on YouTube and write uh, ESI, electro, electron spray ionization, and watch the videos of an electron spray ionization uh, machine, how it works. You should watch it how it works because it's really, really cool the way it works. So what happens is, since there is electric field over here, which we can see, this is the positive uh, side and this is the negative side. So all the positively charged, which these are, which again to mention, these are positively charged. So we're just gonna write that here now. Let me just boom, 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 boom. Okay, so these will go towards the negatively charged electrode. Okay, we know this. So what happens is the water inside this will be pulled, will be pulled because these uh, ions will rush towards the end of the tip. Okay, which is open, it's an open tip. Okay, it's like not, it's not like closed, it's an open, circular normal it's like one of those uh, uh, pipettes that we use in the lab it's an open end at the end and then the water is because of the surface tension it doesn't just immediately eject so the water gets focused to a point it gets pulled pulled pulled, pulled. oh my god the voice crack the voice crack there was crazy okay <laughs> they get pulled the water molecules get pulled and to a tip until the surface surface tension holds on and then boom they ejected like this a huge big chunk is ejected with the protein or the macromolecule in the center surrounded by still some water or solution whatever the solution was still surrounded by some of that particles then what happens is since this is a vacuum okay since this is the vacuum uh dissolves quickly the solvents that means the thing around this the blue part it immediately uh, evaporates boom so then what are we left with? We are left with just after this evaporates, we will be left with just Boom, I need to be clean on these edges here. Oh, shit. Shit. Okay, whatever you could you guys get the main point, right? So I This one looks better. Okay, yeah. So all you're left with, all you're left with are your ions. And that's what you finally want. We just want our ions. We don't want anything else. We don't want the solution. So again, solution is placed with certain pH to charge up these molecules with certain charge, whatever charge they want it to be. They can be negative or positive. Over here, they've chosen it for it to be positive. Then due to the potential, the electrical field applied over here, the positive ions inside the solution are pulled towards the negative uh, electrode and when this happens the solution looks super super cool what happens is like it like points up like you know it gets super sharp at the end because it's holding on because surface tension surface tension because this will come over here so holding on to surface tension, boom and then they're ejected and then this is going to have like a layer of solution around it but then it's, it's completely going to evaporate really really fast because it's all under a vacuum and then we're left with our pretty little ions which we need for the experimentation. Later on, we will analyze them by accelerating the ions. Now, let's look at MALDI. MALDI is a super cool thing. Uh, but le let me try to explain this now, okay? Uh, MALDI. One second. Okay. So, this green part, both the uh, proteins and matrix simulation enter the gas bags. The matrix ionized first, then the matrix prevents fragmentation of protein and ionized matrix molecules ionized proteins. Okay, whatever, whatever. Let's listen to this. So, what happens here? Let me draw another diagram just so it's a bit more clear for you guys. Okay, right here, perfect. It's something like this. There's going to be a tray. How even? I know it's taking some time, but relax. So there's gonna be a structure like that with holes. Okay, many holes, basically acting like a tray. 
a tray where you place the molecules that you want to separate that you want to use and separate using the mass spectrometer uh, spectrometer and yeah here you place your proteins your dna your whatever okay let me just try to i want to make this a bit thinner actually boom uh your dna's i'm drawing them like s's just you know the strands like that maybe whatever you wanna you wanna try uh this this see of course it's used for dna it's it's can be used for proteins it's also used for stuff like you know aldehydes ketones like benzene and all of that kind of stuff okay so this is there but then there's another thing as well around all of this inside these wells like these circle holes also something called you know this thing called a matrix this is like a substance which surrounds the the whatever the particle is that you're trying to separate it surrounds the whole thing okay basically acting like this shield okay from what what is acting a shield from because the coolest thing have ever happens here right now a freaking laser machine okay shoots lasers boom 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 right at there like this is literally the perfect example because it has like the laser looks so cool right now so boom laser goes straight onto this what happens you an analyzing proteins or dna would you want this laser to destroy your dna obviously not so this although may seem pretty pretty harsh but it is one of the soft ionization methods okay it's used, it's actually very cheap, it's actually very easy, it's very widely used and mostly the, the labs in your uh, hospitals and all use this method. So it goes boom, 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 boom. And what happens is, because of the matrix, it's like, kind of like this protection from these direct laser beams. So when these laser beams strike this, they immediately immediately the matrix as well as the whatever that you are analyzing vaporizes immediately and due to the laser what happens is the matrix is also also ionized the matrix is ionized the matrix being the green part it has some sort of a charge let's say plus 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 now because of the fact the matrix ionized this this in turn ionizes the the gaseous molecules of whatever you are trying to separate so these in turn get a ch get ion become ions as well boom 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 that's amazing that's what you want okay so in one step because this laser just got boom and then the tray moves a little bit and it goes boom and then the tray moves a little bit more boom 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 it's cool really cool so then what happens in one step it vaporizes and it ionizes Amazing. That's what we want. We want efficiency. Okay, that's the name of the game. Passion. More passion. Okay. So, that's what we want. And we have it. Now we have it. Now comes our next step. We accelerate these ions. So, now we know the two ways that we're going to do it from. We understood ESI. We understood MALDI. Okay, understand this, 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 this. And yes, please learn these points. Okay. I just said both proteins and matrix enter the gas phase. Matrix ionized first, thus the matrix prevents fragmentation of protein. Ionizes matrix uh, molecule, um, ionized matrix molecules, ionized proteins. Okay. And over here, droplets are found fluid enter due to total and potential difference. Droplets are ionized. Yeah, the potential difference, as I said, like because of the potential difference, these things are pulled towards it. Okay, you understand? Boom, boom, boom. Okay, because of the potential difference, because it's high. Solvent evaporates quickly and completely. Now, now we have got our gas phased ions. Beautiful. Now let's come on to our next step. That is accelerating these ions. Mass spectrum. Accelerate and analyze the ions. Ions. Okay, so basically what we're doing here is we now you should I highly recommend going on YouTube after this because I really can't explain how cool this is i want you to watch specifically one video and i'm gonna I'm, i say i link it in the bottom but i'm never gonna link it because i just i don't know why i keep forgetting so maybe like, i'll just show you right now so you guys can just go over and watch it no not this one uh wait a second 
Oh, you're all going to see my history now. Shit. No, no, no. Wait. Wi-Fi is pretty shit right now. So, uh, uh, this is really cool video where they show like 3D animated how it works. But you should watch that. Now, now what happened? Let's look at this. So, like, let's take, for example, the this setup actually. Okay. Let's make this super small. Let's make this. Okay, let's resize this guy. Boom, I make it super small. Okay, let's move it here. Now what happens, this next step is, there's gonna be a huge tube here. Okay, huge tube like that. Okay, wait, I wanna make it more clean, you know me. Uh, boom beautiful beautiful structure over here now what happens is this has the ends over here are attached to a battery or somehow they are pretty they have an electric field in them okay an electric and magnetic field okay so let's say that this side has a negative charge and this side has a positive charge something like that but this side we know definitely has a negative charge uh, the machine is a very complex machine me drawing it out like this won't really uh, do it justice but yeah now what happens is due to the extreme uh, voltage of this uh, negative side uh, negative electrode these ions which we just produced are accelerated boom 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 and there'll be a detector right about here which will uh basically it's this these things actually uh mass spectrum spectrometry machines they're really smart and by smart i mean like the technology used in them nowadays is around the level of ai it's a very smart machine it, there's a lot of technological like advancements in this machine a lot of analyzation that happens okay so this is a very technically dependent technologically dependent way of separating stuff so our ions go boom 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 and what happens is the smaller particles they go faster and hit them okay and when this detector senses the hitting of any one of these ions the graph goes poop I got hit okay understand and then what happens is now the fatter molecules the bigger molecules they'll hit a little bit slower so now look at the, look at the, look at this what happens the smaller ion goes up first boom all the small ions combined boom 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 boom, boom, boom they hit together so this tweet spike okay and now the fatter molecules fatter molecules hit them boom 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 later on after a little bit of time so after some time it goes poop again and after some time, the more bigger molecules, poop. And this chart that we have here, oh, oh, oh I lost it. I lost it. Basically, the chart looks something like poop, 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 poop. So using this, what do we understand? We understand their mass. We understand their charge. We understand all of these things. So using this, we get their mass by charge ratio. Uh, by which we can analyze different materials, complex complex substances, etc. And this is how it works. But there's also another way. This exactly, this, this setup that I've explained to you right now is called the MALDI TOF method. TOF uh, spectrometer. Spectrometer. Okay. This specifically uses MALDI, like I said over here. Obviously, the lasers hit them and then ionize matrix assisted laser uh, desorption ionization okay and then later on they uses this tube this whole tube is a uh, time of flight time of flight over here where is the time of flight over here time of flight mass spectrometer okay it gives us this is a whole huge tube with a uh, positive and negative ends which attracts these ions and measures the time of flight and because of the heavier molecules reaching later than the lighter molecules there is fluctuation seen in the graph and boom 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 that's why we see a graph that's beautiful beautiful good okay but there's another way what happens is after doing this or some other method like esi maybe 
okay? There is a tube which goes, which runs like this. Okay? And there is a, a heavy amount of magnetic field in this. So we know the magnetic field affects the uh, charged particles. Of course we do. Magnetic field and electric field go hand in hand. So the same thing happens, differentiated by mass and charge. But the, uh, but the guys with the heavier mass, let me draw it with red. The guy with the heavier, heavier mass, this is a little bit lighter and let me draw a little dot over here, okay? So what ends up happening is, let me actually, let me actually, let me do this. Okay, resize and I'm gonna flip this over like that to explain the concept. What ends up happening is since this has, it's like, it's like centrifu centrifugation, almost like centrifugation. So like in centrifugation, the heaviest particles, they come down, yeah? When you spin all that thing, the densest particles they have, with the most mass, they come down first. So when this, when they're going through this curve and they're guided by the magnets, okay, the heavier particles tends to go outside from outside because of like, it's like centrifugation. So the heavier particles go from outside, the, it'll go from a little bit inside and the smallest particles will go from inside like that. Understand? So, that's what happens here. That's exactly what happens here. So now the, fa the fat molecule goes from here, outside. Then the thinner molecule goes from here. And the thinner goes like that. And the detector is placed beautifully right there. And this guy, boom, slaps here, boom, slaps here, boom, slaps here. We get a graph something like this. Again, the same type of graph. But then over here, this is concentrated on this, this is concentrated on this, and this is concentrated on this, okay? They all usually hit it at the same time. It doesn't I always happen, but that's uh, produced over here. So let's look at this again, but more. Ions move along a circular path in the magnetic field. At a given B and U, the ions with different mass to charge ratio move along circles with different radii. Okay? Step two, deflection. Okay, look at this. Magnetic field outward towards the viewer. Large M to C, the, the particles with large M to Q ratio, mass, larger mass, they go from the outsides, okay? And then there's the magnet, of course. Small M to Q ratio, the particles with small M to Q ratio, they go outside, inside like that, from the inside, okay? And this is the ion source, of course, after we ionize it using ESI or MALDI or whatever, it says my battery is low charge, okay, whatever. It goes through it, okay? There are a few equations over here. They're highlighted. Are they in the minimals? No, but they're highlighted and mass spectrometry, there's one question of mass control. So I think we should learn this. Over here, basically, we're finding out the mass to charge ratio, okay? Look over here, what do we have? We have uh, the B and the U, okay? We know B is magnetic field, okay? So over here, that's basically radius by magnetic field by the velocity, okay? This is how we find it, mv squared by r, which is a formula for, uh, if I'm not wrong, let me just, uh, I mean, it's not too important, but I just want to make sure that half mv squared, is that it? No, that is not it. Whatever, square, I don't care. Uh, yeah, this formula, basically this is a derivation, which we don't need. We don't need derivations, we need the final formulas. So, very important, object separated by mass to charge ratio. So obviously you should know what mass to charge is. It's radius into B by velocity of the particles going in there, okay? The larger the radius, of course, uh, the more radius they take, that means they have more mass, basically, okay? Because that's the bigger circle that they're taking, they're going push, they're pushed outwards. I hope you're understanding the concept, okay? I hope really understanding. Acceleration by the electric field uh, is Q, U equals half MV square. Half MV square, we know, is the kinetic kinetic energy. Okay, Yo, what happened here? Okay, yeah. Is the kinetic energy. Q being the charge, we know this. And U over here refers to, one second, Uh, 
there's no you over here included okay let's i should have done this before i'm very sorry uh, i've been like lazy today but let's let's look find out together okay q u is uh, equal no equal to of m b square okay. let's see this what do we see okay 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 you over here should <laughs> i don't want to be wrong one second i don't want to be wrong uh one second one second let's go to images sometimes they have those images and they they write them uh, finding this out together guys or you can you probably just skip this or i'll probably just cut this part out so internet's been so bad today no 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 no, no. connect to my boy Arham's phone. Wait a second, guys. Uh, please open the page. Please go ahead. Okay, so over here, Q refers to the potential energy and uh, potential energy over here is obviously converted into kinetic energy. We have the potential energy, we accelerate them and then uh, due to the kinetic energy, which is basically the speed, the velocity that we move with mass into mv square. Okay, we get that and then this is basically the acceleration by the electric field. How do you accelerate it? We apply a certain potential energy in the magnetic field or the electric field, which accelerates these ions. And because of these acceleration of these ions, it produces kinetic energy. And because of that ex acceleration, this kind of, ugh, I'm repeating this. Because of the uh, acceleration, kinetic energy is increased. And because of kinetic energy is the, re the whole reason that we're getting this different circles, we're getting the detectors, all because we gave the ions potential energy to accelerate. And then we, uh, the, due to the acceleration, we got kinetic energy. So basically this is the formula potential energy equals q u okay and then this is half mv square which we you should know this is in the minimals uh, the first question in the minimals crazy if you guys didn't know that that's crazy and then uh, we get a small from uh, m to from these two formulas what do we get we get this very important to remember this okay we get m is equal to b b square magnetic field square radius squared charge is equal to q potential energy Okay, Q2 into potential energy. Okay, very important. So that, oh no, no, this is again, the mass spectrometry time of flight thing, as I explained. Uh, ions with different masses can be detected as a function of time, faster they, so they reach uh, the detector after a shorter time. Sm ions with smaller mass move faster. I explained this almost. So yes, this is gonna be the region that, the tube that I drew, and this is gonna be the detector, the electric field is ion source, and boom, 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 boom. You saw it, we understood this. Okay, and this is the time required to cover the drift, re drift region being this. Okay, so this is a formula that we should also learn that refers to the length, mass, 2, Q, U. Okay, so that was that, guys. I hope you understand. Force is acting on a molecule upon sedimentation. That's why we've been given the diagrams where they have the molecule and they show the forces. Other than that, uh, you sh it should be basic common sense. You should know where the uh, forces are applied. Physical principles, I hope you understood. Similarities and differences between protein and nucleic acid electrophoresis. You're gonna, protein is uh, SDSPH and uh, actual electric focusing. DNA is uh, electrophoresis, gel, gel electrophoresis essential parts of mass spectrometers and their function. I really, really recommend going on YouTube right now, 
typing in maldi tof m a l d i tof just write that out and you're gonna get crazy animations they're gonna be so good let me let me i have to show you the guy that you guys that video one second one second uh yeah this one Broker Deltonics. I'm not gonna show them the video right now because I don't know what I'm what's gonna happen. But yeah, Broker Deltonics. Watch this video, please. It's really, really nice. Watch this video. Okay. Yes. Now let's do the minimals. Let's do the minimals. Uh, basic uh, physical definitions. No, we don't have this. What do we have? What do we have? We have it on the 16th page. We have a few questions right here. Uh, yes, right here. Explain the aim and principle of mass spectrometry. The aim of the mass spectrometry is to determine the charge to mass ratio of the particles, like we discussed. The ionized form of the investigated substances should be introduced to the gaseous phase and then accelerated into electric field. Finally, the charge to mass ratio is determined by different methods. We, should only, we don't need to explain the method, we just need to know this, right? So, first we take our uh, particles, vaporize them, give them charge, ionize them, accelerate them, detect them boom list the forces and their directions acting on a molecule sedimentation in a centrifuge force centrifuge tube we know due to centrifugation the centrifugal force acts this way the end of the tube so fc but then there's buoyant force because of the solution and frictional force so we have two forces coming like this one force coming like that so it should be written over should be what's written over here Centrifugal point of force pointing away from the axis of rotation and both frictional force and buoyant force pointing towards the axis. Pretty simple, guys. Define sedimentation, give it a unit. Sedimentation consists is the sedimentation consists is the sedimentation velocity of a molecule achieved at unit acceleration. That is uh, the that is the sedimentation velocity divided by the centripetal acceleration. Basically, Swedberg's equation, guys. See over here, the equation is not there, but I will highly recommend that you learn the Swedberg's equation. Okay. So you understand how the Swedberg equation affects the, it says Swedberg equation is M into 1 minus delta, uh, no, density of the solution, density of the particle divided by F. So you should know this, you should know, uh, very important. And learn the value of one Swedberg, very important. 10 raised to minus 3 seconds, super small. Basically, it's just like uh, electrophoretic mobility. Uh, electrophoretic mo mobility explained as what? how much uh, velocity a particle moves with when one coulomb of electric field is applied in the gel yeah same way when one uh, i don't know what like like acceleration okay how much acceleration like when you go from zero to one kilometers per hour okay obviously it's only probably not going to be that fast but let's go from zero to uh, six thousand re revolutions per minute for the centrifuge tube how much does uh, the particle move? It's like the equivalent to, it's like the centrifuge equivalent for the electrophoretic mobility, okay? That we, okay, how can I define an unknown macromolecule be determined by sedimentation experiments? Macromolecules centrifuge in a density gradient, uh, cesium chloride, CSCL, CSCL, we did this guys. Stop sedimenting in the layer whose density is identical to their own, okay? How does sedimentation equilibrium depend on the form factor of the case and in the case of sedimentation equilibrium method and why it is independent because after reaching the equilibrium molecules stop moving how does the equilibrium depend on the form factor in the case of sedimentation equilibrium okay in the sedimentation equilibrium method what happens is we discuss this uh we leave it spinning at a very low rpm for days or even weeks We'll let it happen all the stuff gets deposited over here whether it be small or or large at the end if you spin it for days or weeks all the particles are going to get in the solution they're going to get dissolved here what is the principle of diffusion objects will tend to move from a area of higher concentration to lower concentration and after a long time that's what happens all the particles start moving away from the higher concentration okay the molecules that are the smallest go up the most and the biggest they stay over here okay so over in this equilibrium uh, method uh, this velocity equilibrium method we use it to determine the molecular weight okay in the velocity method in the sedimentation velocity method which is super super fast the form factor matters a lot it does matter a lot okay because it's we're doing it fast okay boom we spin it for some time and we're, we're calculating everything 
So we ideally, uh, we have to take into, into consideration the form factor. Maybe the object has a lower mass, but because of the way it's shaped, it didn't reach the bottom. Understand? Okay, so we have to consider F when we're using the sedimentation velocity method. But for equilibrium method, we're leaving it in there for days, for weeks. So form factor doesn't really matter because we're waiting for it. We're giving it its time. Okay, whatever your form factor be, uh, be, go and settle wherever you are comfortable. Okay, basically. So form factor doesn't really matter over here. So it's independent because after reaching the equilibrium, molecules stop moving. One word, uh, one line answer, guys, come on. Electrophoretic mobility. Electrophoretic mobility is the velocity generated by unit electric field center. I hope you understand this one. List the factors affecting the electrophoretic mobility of a macromolecule. Obviously, molecular mass. Okay. Uh, net charge and pH of the medium. Okay. But then let's go to the formula over here. So that it's going to be easier for you to also understand. Oh, not here. Not here. Uh, let me go to the formula. Electrophoretic mobility is here. This is electrophoretic mobility. So you can see that, uh, of course, the mass matters. Of course, it does. Uh, U, V, you get V over here. Okay. And V, an electric field. But you're going to say, okay, fine. Where's the mass? There's no mass. Don't be stupid. Okay. Literally, don't be like. Mass still matters, even though electrophoretic mobility just says velocity and electric field. Over here, we can see molecular mass is definitely more is important. It's not more important, but it's definitely important. If you're heavy as shit, you're not going to move, okay? Like, it's just common sense, okay? Net charge, of course, if you have more charge, you're going to scurry towards the positive side or negative side, whatever, okay? Page of the medium. Uh, the pH of the medium that you're in, of course, because the pH, as we learned, it's very, it changes the whole experiment. pH basically means if it has less pH, it has more hydronium ions, increasing the charge of the, of the medium. If it's more, it means as OS, it has more OH ions, which means it, uh, in negatively charges the whole medium. So it's very important, all of this. Okay. So we need to take those into consideration. Remember molecular mass, net charge, pH of the medium. Very, maybe like, maybe you also use your brain sometimes, okay? Of course, molecular mass. Oh my God, my voice cracking is crazy. Molecular mass, of course, because if you're fat as shit, you're not moving, okay? Net charge, of course. If you have more charge, you're going to get more attracted to the electrode and you're going to run towards it faster. pH of the medium. Of course, you don't want your pH, the medium of the, the, the medium affecting whatever you're doing with, uh, doing uh, electrophoresis. You don't want the medium to disturb it. You don't want it to have its own charge and the liquid is going to the electrode, like negative electrode. Bro, you, you're, you're examining the particles and the liquid itself is going to the electrode. Bro, how's that going to work out? It's not going to work out. <laughs> you, so you want only the macromolecules to go to the electrode. But then if this guy's pH is a bit too low and it's positively charged, it goes towards the positive, uh, negative electrode, bro. And then the... You, uh, you understand me. You, you understand me. You understand me. You understand me. What is the principle of ISO and form factor? Form factor. Form factor also. Don't forget that. Please. Please don't forget that. Again, uh, if you're slim and slender like this pen, easily maneuver to the matrix. If you're fat as shit, can't do shit. Okay? Principle of isoelectric focusing during the electrophoresis in a pH gradient. Each compound migrates towards the location where the pH is equal to the isoelectric point. At this point, net charge of the molecule becomes zero. Come on, guys. We learned this. Do I have to explain it again? I'm tired. I want to go sleep. I hope you're smart enough. You're not that dumb, right? Okay. So boom. That's there then. We have finished this chapter. Coming to you with the next video I'm going to make is uh, ray optics. Optical uh, instruments and all that. So we'll see you in that video. Later on, I'll also do the nuclear charge thing. So nuclear radiation and all that nonsense. So we'll help you there as well. Hope you guys do good in the SCTs. And... Uh, Guys, I'm a student as well. I'm in first year as well. If I've made any mistakes, feel free to like absolutely bash me in the comments, okay? Because if you do that, I'll make the change and I'll learn myself as well, okay? If you find any mistake in my videos, if you find that, okay, fine, this is wrong, what he's saying, I apologize in advance. But if, you, if there is anything wrong, please let me know. Please let me know that there is something wrong, okay? Either personal message me on Instagram, 
WhatsApp message me or just bash me in the comments. I don't care. Okay, do it though. So yeah, uh, I love you guys. I hope you guys have a good STT and uh, I'll see you guys later. Bye.